It's flannel off real fast. It, no, it, it's not going to be a minute switch. But um, no, I I'm I'm I just love to have a good time when I'm preaching. So uh, y'all ready for today? Yep. All right. Well, uh, we're gonna jump right into it. I'm gonna be talking today, um, about the key to an effective ministry. Why don't y'all say it with me? The key to an effective ministry. The reason why I, ha- I do that is because I'm a youth pastor and uh, students tend to zone out a lot. So <laughs> got to catch them in there with that repetition. So uh, if y'all want to open up with me to Luke chapter 11, verse 5 through 13, we're going to kind of be jumping all over the place today. Um, this is going to be more of a topical message, but the best way to read the Bible is let the Bible interpret itself. Amen. Would you agree with that? I hope you would. Hope you would. So uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 5 through 13, this is talking about uh, asking uh, for the Holy Spirit. It's a great thing. Holy Spirit is amazing. I, I love his ministry and what he does. And uh, let's just read this very briefly. Um, and Jesus is in, the, in this passage. He's talking about prayer. All right. And so um, as he's talking about prayer, he, he mentions uh, the uh, Lord's prayer and he goes on to verse five and he says this. Then he said to them, which of you has a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine on his journey has come to me and I have nothing set before him. First of all, I got to say, if you're knocking on your neighbor's door at midnight, it's like, what is your deal? Just run over to Walmart or something, you know, if you're going to want. But uh, apparently they didn't have Walmart back then. But uh, for a friend of mine is on his journey, has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within. This is what I would say. Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you anything. I say to you, though, he will not rise and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as much as he needs. How many of y'all would do that, right? If your friend just keeps bugging you, you be like, all right, dude, I'll give you some loaves of bread. Here you go. Just stop. Go back to bed. Verse 9, and I will tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. If a son asks for bread from any of you who is a father, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, first of all, I, I do not like eggs, by the way, so I would never ask for an egg. I don't know why I'm saying that, but every time I see egg, I'm just like, Ugh, like I do like Cadbury eggs, though. Um, but if he asks for an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? Ouch. If you then, being evil, I love, okay, I love Jesus' side remarks sometimes. He just, like, has to throw in some, like, punches in there. If you being evil, ouch. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Is that cool or what? Don't y'all love the Word of God? And so there's a, a trust there that if we ask for the Holy Spirit, that God will give us the Holy Spirit. We're not going to get a counterfeit spirit. We're not going to get any of that. If we have a purity of heart and we want to genuinely encounter the Lord, if we want to genuinely um, come in contact with God, he will meet us, right? Because we're he, why would he give us something else? And so um, today I'm talking to you about the key to an effective ministry, and I believe that one of the main keys to an effective ministry is the demonstration of the character of God by the revealing of his presence. The word of God, the scripture, is the foundation for everything the Holy Spirit does. Holy Spirit will never do anything outside of the character of God because he is God. And so what I'm saying by this is that if we want to encounter the presence of God, then it starts right here with the word of God. I think oftentimes we try to separate the word of God and the presence of God. You can't do that. They're one and the same. And so for my circle, I, I do come from a more charismatic background, if you can't tell already. Um, but uh, many times in my circle, we love to isolate the presence of God from the word of God. And if you begin to do that, you get into very weird stuff very fast. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> really weird stuff. And so there needs to be such a, an extreme 
an extreme emphasis on the word of God when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, when we're talking about the things of God, because the word of God is the, is the final authority on the things of God. You can't, God will never encounter you or do something in your life that's outside the realms of scripture. Would you agree with me on that? Awesome. So we need, and I believe that we need a present work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's not just like we can't rely on it. We need that fresh bread. We need something fresh in our lives. We can't rely on something that happened 10 years ago. We need that daily encounter in the presence of the Lord. And I'm telling you, that's a key to an effective ministry. If we are genuinely asking God to reveal the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, we will not be disappointed. We will be given the real thing. So I'm going to talk to you, to you about, about a couple of things. But before we begin, this is just kind of my intro. I want to define for you what the presence of God is because that can go either way. We can It can get super mystical, super whatever, real fast. You know what I'm saying? So I just want to put a, a, a really good definition of what you guys know what I mean when I'm saying the presence of God so we're on the same page. Um, I want to say, first of all, that I'm not talking about mysticism, Okay. We're not talking about mystical stuff that I'm gonna that when you're seeking the presence of God, you're gonna be over here levitating, floating off the ground, and you're gonna find a deeper meaning to life outside of the word. No, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about when we're describing, and I want to say this too, we aren't trying to obtain within ourselves some hidden knowledge that is outside of scripture. That's key, because that's when you get into the mindset of mysticism and that mystic uh just ways of, of thinking. It's about finding some sort of hidden knowledge. We're not doing that. We're, we're trying to get in the presence of God into the creator, into the word. And so when we are talking about the presence of God, what I'm referring to is an awareness of God in our midst. It's an awareness of who he is, his character, his will, his attributes in our midst. So anytime, and I got this from um, I'llBeHonest.com. I don't know if y'all ever checked out that website before. It's pretty cool. They have a lot of cool, there's like these video teachings with a dude, dude named Tim, Pastor Tim, I don't know. Ask, what was it? You, you know, you like nodding your head like, what is it? It's like ask Pastor Tim or something. He has all these. And so um, there's this one teaching has on there. It's like presence of God or mysticism. I would encourage you to check that that out. It's a like an hour and a half long video. But anyway, I got this from the website. Anytime we're dealing with experiences in the Christian life, we need to be careful and we need to look at what the Bible says. I could just stop preaching right there, like we're done, you know what I'm saying? Um, we need to look at what the Bible says. We need to make sure that we're not looking for something more than what's revealed in the Bible. Hello, that's good. But we also need to be careful that we're not satisfied with something less than what we see in the Bible. So I love that balance that he puts in there. We can't be satisfied with, with, what we're not, you know, with something less than the Bible, but at the same time, we can't be looking for something more than what's revealed in the Bible. So I want to say this too when we're in terms of the presence of God. Uh, God is omnipresent. Does anyone know what that word means? You guys are all present, right? He's all, all around us 24-7. It doesn't mean that he's in everything. There's a key difference. It doesn't mean that God is in this chair or that he's in this pulpit or that he's like in this sheet. Like, no, that's a completely different religion. And if you believe that, please get your facts straight. <laughs> no, God is omnipresent. He's all around us. Not that he is in everything, but he's all around us, all right? Meaning that he's everywhere, not that he's in everything. And today I want to talk about specifically the manifest presence of God. That's when we either, either, one or two ways I believe that the manifest presence of God comes about. It's either we become aware of him or he chooses to reveal himself in an extraordinary way. We see that throughout scripture. Um, I believe that we, that a key to an effective ministry is to constantly be aware of the presence of God. That's what we're talking about, an awareness that he is with us, an awareness that he's around us. And that's the best way to have the fear of the Lord in you. You know what I'm saying? Try to get away with sin when you know that God is right there next to you, watching you like, hello, you know, that will open your eyes. So that's the, that, that's the presence of God. And so I want to give you a quote by a good guy. His name's A.W. Tozer. Hopefully he's a good report here. Y'all, you like him? He could be considered a mystic, mystic or not. I hope, I don't believe he is. But uh, I, I thought I would quote something from him real fast that I agree with. He says, I want the presence of God himself or I don't want anything at all to do with religion. I want all that God has or I don't want any. 
And that's my heart today. I, I honestly, with a pure heart, can say that I, I want God. I love Jesus with all my heart. I believe that he died, he rose again for my sins. You know what I'm saying? And I, that's, I, I say this all in the purity of heart that I want all that God has to offer. And I don't want to get outside the realms of scripture. And um, So what I'm going to do today, uh, that was just my long, very long intro. But uh, I want to say for youth pastors, you don't get to speak more than 20 minutes. So when Brandon's like, you have 35 minutes, I'm like, yes, I can, I can finally speak to people that, that their attention span is longer than three minutes. No, but so maybe, I don't know. Some of y'all I see are nodding off right now. Um, but my goal today is to teach on the need for the presence of God in our ministries. I will do so by briefly sharing my personal testimony, and then we're going to examine the lives of three biblical men or people found in the Bible. And then I will share some practical tips on building um, a presence-driven ministry, something that, that, that you long to see the presence of God revealed in. Um, so uh, y'all ready? Let's begin. Oh, can I, I want to, oh, actually, I, I skipped over this. Let me read this for you real fast. The manifest presence of God reveals the character of God. See, if someone's encountering the presence of God, but they have some sort of extra biblical revelatory experience or knowledge that's coming from that, then immediate red flag, I'm like, yo, get out of here. You did not encounter God because whatever the whatever God does, it's going to, I love that sound. That's beautiful. Whatever God does, he's, he's, it's going to be in accordance with his power. And I want to say this too, that um, it's the Holy Spirit revealing his word to us. It's more than a feeling. It's his, it's his power. The Holy, Spirit can't, the Holy Spirit can move in power. It's not just on an intellectual level, but it can be an experiential encounter in the spirit, the pneuma, the soul, the psyche, and the body, the soma. And if you're a Greek scholar here and I'm like, misquoting this please forgive me but God is not just a, I want to make this clear too that God is not just a God of intellect we can't just isolate God to intellect there, there there's multiple perspectives to the human body and anytime we have an encounter with God it should never be outside the realms of his character and his word we like to, to we cannot I, I can't stress that enough the character of God is revealed in the word of God and anytime God moves you cannot isolate that all right I think I'm just kind of beating that into y'all head over and over again. And I want to say this too, I'm not, un, I'm under the persuasion, and we'll get into what, my personal testimony here, but I'm under the persuasion. This is why this is an Aikido effective ministry. I'm under the persuasion that today the church does not need more fluff. The church does not need more flashy lights. The church does not need a better music team, blah, 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 a better message, a pastor with skinny jeans on preaching. Pastor Brandon, by the way, you're almost on those skinny jeans. You got to get with, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, we don't need that stuff, you guys. Like, for real, if you think that that's the definition of a successful church or an effective church, I would say you're probably wrong in your perception of that. We don't need flashing lights. We don't need crazy music, all this extra stuff. I believe we need the real thing. We need the word of God. And I believe it's impossible to separate the presence of God and the word of God. They're one and the same. Because the word of God brings an awareness of what? His presence. So let me share you my, my qu a quick personal testimony and a story. See, I got real, like born again uh, or really pursued Jesus, I, I would say, because I, I believe I got saved when I was younger, but I kind of fell off the bandwagon. And uh, <laughs> um, I was 17 years old. And I, I mean, I, I just went all out for God. Like, I would study his word. What's actually funny is that... Um, I got into some, <laughs> this is so funny, I got into some of John MacArthur's teachings thinking that it was something else, and I would just study him all day long. I saw you have a master's shirt on, master's university. I, I, my, my realm of people, they grew up in, um, or I had a lot of friends in master's commission, and I thought John MacArthur was the guy that invented master's commission. Okay, and so somehow I got into John, and if you know John MacArthur and master's commission, completely different realms of you know com like you can't even compare the two you know uh, but I got into this I, I just loved it I ate it up I got into guys like Paul Washer and I would read Charles Spurgeon I would read all, 
reformed the I was so reformed actually for the longest time. And I think so that's where I got my roots in was a lot of reformed theology. And I, I just love the reformers and what they do. And so um I got into all of this and I I, mean, I just ate up the word of God. I was hungry for it. I kept going in. But somewhere along the line, like I would isolate myself. I'm not saying that this just to boast, but, but this is where I was at. I would isolate and spend so much time in the word of God that my parents are like, Nick, we're going to have to take your Bible away because you're not spending time with us. I'm like, get behind me, Satan. No, I never said that. But I'm like, what's going on here? But obviously there's a balance to that. Like you have to make room for other people in your life. You can't just be in your room all day just like, studying and studying and studying and studying because what will happen is that you'll begin to actually deceive yourself into thinking that you have a relationship with God that's not really there because you filled your mind up with all this facts and information. God's not just an intellectual God. He's a God of your, what does the word say? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, not just one aspect. And so I actually isolated my pursuit of God to one aspect of that. And I deceived myself into thinking I had a relationship with God that wasn't really there. Let me give you a story that kind of further illustrates this point. I was um, on the Yukon River, and I was going out to this camp, this a Bible camp, and we're we're going out in the middle of nowhere. We're and um, we're doing the uh, we're holding supplies up there. All right, and um, we had extreme shallows. Does anyone know what those boats are? They're like. They're like, they're not made for the Yukon River. <laughs> they're, they're like jet boats in a sense, all right? We had three of these boats. We filled it up with so much, like they were weighed down with equipment. And the best way that we thought that we could save um, money or fuel money was to have one boat in the front and tie the other boats to the back, all right? And so we had one boat in the front. And so this boat was leading us and somehow we thought we were saving fuel. Maybe we were, maybe we were not but we were going really slow. And if you know anything about navigating the Yukon River, any river in general, that you have to be careful for sandbars, right? Because if you hit a sandbar, especially with that much equipment on your boat, you could easily get stuck and like you're just messed up now. And so we're going on the river and um, my friend, my dad and I were in one boat. My friend and um, the, the, the director was in this boat and we had another guy in the front, you know, two guys in that boat. And so we're going, and all of a sudden, sandbar, sandbar. We're like, we're scrambling. We have to untie the boats. And so my friend's over here in this boat and we're, we're uh, he, he's cutting the ropes. And the boat that I was in over here, so pretend that I'm my friend, all right? But and I'm in this boat over here. And um, this boat is coming over and is about to collide into his boat. And um, he reaches out because he's like, maybe if I kick the boat, it won't, it won't go. So he reaches out to to kick out. And what he's this huge six foot four black dude. I love this guy. He's my best friend. His name's Clarence. And um, in fact, I'm gonna see him tomorrow. Yes, I haven't seen him in a long time. But um, so he is uh he's about to kick the boat out. But what he didn't know was that um Pastor Ron was in it was in the the front of that boat doing the same thing so he beat him to it so when he reaches out there's no boat for him to kick onto and it's just the Yukon River and he falls straight into the middle of the Yukon River I was like Clarence like I'm like flipping out because like I know people that have died drowning in this river like no lie and so um he was under there for a good 10 seconds I'm like I don't know. Okay, I'm, I could be exaggerating, but you know how when like something traumatic happens, it's like all time just stops, and you're just like, "Where is he? Where is he?" All of a sudden, he like jumps out. He's like, "Phew!" And he like is right in front of my boat, and but he still has his buck knife in his hand. So I go to like grab his hand, and he like swinging this buck knife like, "Phew!" I'm like, "Whoa!" Drop the knife. Drop the knife. So he finally drops the knife. We pull him up, and the funniest part of this whole story actually was that um, he had one of those life jackets that react to water, you know, and then they're, when you hit water, they're supposed to like, phew. he's already been out the water for like 10 seconds after, the, and then it finally explodes like, phew. and I'm like, so don't ever get, just get, just go with a regular life jacket, you know, because those things don't really work. But, uh, and this dude was drenched. He was soaked in water. Why do I tell you this story? Is because I, I believe it illustrates something, is that Clarence, he had a, a, a knowledge, an intellectual knowledge of the Yukon River. He'd actually been on the river multiple times before. He had been um, 
navigating the Yukon River. The Yukon River changes so much, it's kind of hard to grasp how to navigate it. But um, he, he, he had a basic understanding of how, that, how the river went. And he, he, he could see the water. He was in the boat. He could see the water, how, how powerful it was, how mighty it was. And he had this intellectual knowledge of it. But he never actually experienced the river until that moment. And so I can guarantee you that you can never argue with Clarence the mighty power of the Yukon River. You can never argue with Clarence that the river rushing through him, how dangerous it could be. You know what I'm saying? And so I believe that's similar, similar in our pursuit with God. We could have such an intellectual knowledge of who God is, of his character, of his attributes. But it's one thing to, to know it. It's another thing to actually experience the raw power of God, to, to experience who he is, his will, his character, his goodness, to have an encounter with the living God. Does that make sense? So I want to give you, in, in my personal testimony, it, it, and what, what, what rocked my boat, no pun intended, um, in this was Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. And this was the defining verse that shifted my perspective of who God is. And, and it, it's this, but, and Paul is saying this. He says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And if you know anything about the context of this verse, Paul is listing off his um pedigree or for lack of better words for who he is he's like yo i was i was a hebrew of hebrews i was born on uh i was circumcised on the eighth day i was you know i study on under glamiel i don't know if he says this and this but that that's he he was a a student of the word of god he had a lot of intellectual knowledge of god but paul had an encounter with christ jesus himself that knocked him off his high horse and from that moment he was never the same and he actually said i would consider everything else as garbage for knowing knowing jesus and this verse just rocked me so let's go over three people how am i doing on time bro how many i don't i wish i'd put my timer on noon okay about 15 minutes. Okay, so let's go over the, the first. I'm going to give you two um, um, people from the Old Covenant, Old Testament, and then one from the, the New Testament that, that, were, that their ministries and that the reality of who they were were marked by the presence of God. Remember when we were talking about the presence of God, we're talking about an awareness of him, something that, that, that maybe even an, an encounter with the presence of God that is defined for us within the context of Scripture. So Exodus 33, verses 12 through uh, 22, we're talking about Moses here. This is a very popular um, uh, passage of Scripture. Let me, let me get here for you, and I'll just read it very briefly. Exodus 33, verses 12 through 22. And this is right before they get into uh, the, the promised land. And um, Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. And yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your way that I may know you and that I may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And God said, and, and it actually says, and he said, but referring to God, says this, but my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Verse 15, then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. I believe that should be a, 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 a desperate like plea in our in regards to ministry for us. That I will, God, I don't want to come up here and preach your word if your presence won't be made known to people. Like that should be a desperate thing in our heart that before you ever get up to the pulpit to speak, you should spend time in prayer and, 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 and asking God to reveal his character to people. If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. And this is key. For how will it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us that we will be distinguished? I and your people from all the people who are on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. 
Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And, and we know uh, the, the rest of the passage of scripture, God reveals himself and his goodness. He can't reveal all of who he is because if that were to ever happen, we'd like probably just disintegrate. Like, pff, you know, he's like, you can't handle all of who I am, but I will show you a portion. Turn your face and I'll, I'll show you my goodness. Okay. So there's a, a let me just read it for you real fast because it actually ties into my next thing. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. This is God speaking. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. He said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Indeed, there is a place by me. You must stand on the rock while my glory passes by. I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you will see my back, but my face may not be seen. I, I just love how, how he says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. There's a key. When the presence of God is revealed, the character and the attributes of God are made known. The goodness of God is made known. Okay, are you guys tracking with me? We know that the Hebrew word for glory is a Hebrew word meaning kavod. It's the root word. Uh, that for, uh, the, this comes from the root word to mean weighty or heavy, meaning that when God reveals himself in this way, there is such a weightiness that fills the room. What we learned from this passage is that the manifest presence of God amongst his people is what distinguishes us from the rest of the world. People don't need entertainment. Like I tell my youth students this all the time. I'm so jealous over our Wednesday nights. They're gonna get the word of God and they're gonna experience the presence of God. I can guarantee it. Because whenever the word of God is preached, his presence follows. An awareness of who he is follows that. I tell them, I don't need to bring you entertainment. Like, you can entertain yourselves. Y'all know, y'all probably all have PS4 is better than Xbox One, just saying. But y'all all have video games. Y'all know how to entertain. Y'all have Netflix, Disney+. Plus. Y'all have unlimited entertainment. Can we just maybe spend for an hour and 15 minutes in a place where we're entertained by God? by his word, not by flashy lights or, or games or whatever. And students will actually appreciate you if you're up front with that. I believe people are actually looking for the real thing. And if you're up front with them about this, that's why this isn't a key to an effective ministry, is that if you're up front with them about the word of God is real, the word of God actually holds weight and value in your life. And if you proclaim that and mean it, people will value that. What people don't like is hypocrisy. People don't like fake stuff. When you're getting up in the front and yet you have all this entertainment going on and yet you're trying to, it, it, it seems like a double standard. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to ramble too much on that. Do, do, do you guys hear me on that? Okay, good. So people don't need entertainment. We have so much entertainment today. When people come into our churches, they should be marked by the word of God and the sense of his presence. His holy presence. It's not something to be tainted with. I'm not taking the presence of God lightly when I'm saying it. It's not like this, oh, yay, Holy Spirit's here. Woo. Like, no, it's like, this is a holy God, y'all. Like, this is someone that, that, that created the universe. Wow. So if Moses could experience the glory of God under the old covenant in this manner, how much more glorious should the ministry of the Spirit, the new covenant, be with us? 2 Corinthians um, three seven through nine says this now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses's face because of its glory that would be wild to see someone that that was in the glory of God and their face actually glowing I would be freaked out I would probably can I say that freaked out I'd probably just like run away but um because of its glory which was being brought to an end will not the ministry of the spirit have even more glory for if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. So that's the first person. And the, 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 what I, the reason why I bring up Moses is because he had such a desperate thing in his heart to be marked by the presence of God. That, that He was convinced that that was the key thing that distinguished him from the rest of the world. And what you see that the word was given actually after the presence of God was revealed. You can't separate the two. The Ten Commandments was given right after this, or the new Ten Commandments was, was given. Um, and so let's go into this. Let's see. I got seven minutes, y'all. I'm going to blaze through this. Y'all ready for this? David, David, am, am I, are y'all tracking with me? Is this good? I need some, just some, some eye contact. That's good. All right. I need some water too. I'm like, 
But uh, David, y'all probably knew I was going to go there. David, he is awesome. And, and David shows us that the presence of God is experiential. I know sometimes we, we don't like to talk about experience when it comes to church or God. And I believe that it's, it's true that we, cannot, we can never build our life um, with God based upon feeling. Would you all agree with me on that? Because to be honest with you, this world kind of sucks. This world, like, if we, like, built our life with God off of feeling, then it would lead us downhill so fast. So when I'm talking about the presence of God, I'm not talking about feeling. I'm talking about an awareness of who he is. But he, it, but it, it can be experiential. The presence of God can be experiential. I don't want to devalue that. I don't want to, to, but, but our, our, our relationship with him is built off the word of God. David is saying, or I, I, I'm not going to read all these verses, but if you're, if you're taking notes, Psalm 34, verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. There's a tasting, it's, it's talking about an experiential. He, he's actually, t- taste and see that the Lord is good. You can taste and see that God is good. Just like I'm about to taste some of this water. Y'all going to see it's good. Mm. No, I'm just kidding. My soul thirsts for you in a dry and weary land, Psalm 63. Woo! So uh, Psalms 27 verse 13 says that I will see your goodness in the land of the living. Psalm 21 verse 6. Pastor Tim actually uh, in this I'll be honest uh, thing, this is where I got this from. For you place blessings on him forever and you make him rejoice with gladness with your presence. And this is David referring to himself. David was writing this, you place blessings on him forever. You make him rejoice with gladness with your presence. So there's a joy in the presence of God. There's the fullness of joy. It's not a creepy thing. It's not just only for the charismatics. <laughs> it's not. It's not a Pentecostal thing. We don't. I, and I think sometimes on my end, I'll just be. I'm not trying to fake that. I'm not charismatic. I am, but I, I believe that we get it wrong by placing such an emphasis on the presence of God and not the Word of God. It's not just for us. There, we, everybody, everybody has access to Him. All right. So maybe I'll, I'll just I'll just uh, close on David. The next guy I was going to say on Paul, I was going to talk about Paul. But um, David is saying in these verses that the presence of God can be experienced. It's not wrong to experience the presence of God. In fact, it is biblical. Our goal is not just to write off of feelings. At the end of the day, the word of God is the lens in which we need to live by. I'm not intimidated by feelings. I'm not persuaded by feelings. I'm persuaded by the word of God. The word of God gets the final say in whatever I do. And if actually I have an experience that doesn't match up with the word of God, I throw it out. Or maybe I haven't yet experienced what the word of God says. I I will be hungry until I see that revealed in my life. We should long for the presence of God to accompany his word in our ministry. Why? Because the presence of God reveals his character. David states several times about the goodness of God. Taste and see the Lord is good. We went over that. See the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We we went over that. The goodness of God or the presence of God which reveals his goodness. Because remember when, when Moses asked for God to reveal his glory, his goodness was revealed right after that. Will actually cause sinners to convert. This is why it's important for us. This is why this isn't a key to an effective ministry, the presence of God. It causes sinners to convert. Romans 2, 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's goodness is meant to lead you to repentance? Simply put, David recognized that the presence of God is experiential. And if we want people to convert, if we want people to uh, become disciples and to follow after Jesus, I believe that it needs to be marked by the presence of God and awareness of who he is in our midst. And so um, I have notes. If y'all want to take them, you can got, c- kind of dis- dissect them more. Forgot to send them to you. for your print. I printed them out this morning, actually. But um, uh, I'm going to close with this. Um, I would encourage you to take these notes just to Maybe I'm wrong in this, and y'all can y'all can discuss it and say this dude was wrong in this area, but I don't think I was. I think I, th- I think I've been preaching the word of God. Um, I can say that with confidence. But um, conclusion: 
I'm, I'm ending in this. I'm going to give you just really qu quick three of the most practical tips that you can have for an effective ministry. By the way, we cannot replace successful ministry with an effective ministry. They're not the same thing. A successful ministry can be, hey, you have a lot of people in your church. You're doing great. Woo. No, just because you're successful doesn't mean you're effective. I'm actual, I'm act, I'm after an effective. I'm after an effective ministry. I'm after, after one where I don't care how many students show up. It could be 11 students show up. But yet they're, they're being affected by the word of God. Their lives are being changed. And 20 years from now, I can guarantee you that they're going to be rooted in the word of God. They're not going to fall away. Well, they have that. That's up to them. But I'm not going to get into that debate. Okay, conclusion. But here's, here's three, three, um, three tips. You ready for this? And I am, I just got one minute. Woo! First one, spend time with God, all right? We cannot devalue this. Spend time with God. What you do in secret will be made manifest in public. If you're aware of the presence of God in your own life, it will bleed into your public ministry. That's the first one, spend time with God. Don't ever devalue that. The next one, place the highest emphasis on the authority of Scripture. Whatever you do, teach the word of God. Do not teach opinion. Do not teach what, you're, what, what you think should be taught. Teach the word of God teach that in place that that's the highest emphasis on the authority of scripture and his presence will always follow his word i can guarantee it the next is prayer don't be afraid and this is for anyone that's called to be a pastor or called to be in ministry um don't be afraid to do pre-service prayer don't be afraid to, to maybe even have a prayer night in your ministry um this is crucial for teaching people how to engage with god like, don't be afraid of that. We need to teach. I love how you, we had that moment of prayer in there. We need that. So those three tips were an effective ministry, a presence-driven youth ministry, or that's what we are, but ministry right there. Spend time with God. Place highest, highest emphasis on the scripture. And pray with your congregation. Not just by yourself, but with your congregation. All right, I'm going to close out and hand it out to Pastor Brandon. God, we love you so much. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are with us in our midst and that we aren't, I thank you that you've given us such a great way to live our life by that actually goes beyond um, feelings, that goes beyond um, all of that because your word of God is what guides us. It's the light upon our path. And so I pray that your word today would be revealed in a greater way in our hearts and our souls, our, our spirits, and that you would guide us in every aspect of your life and in our life. We love you. Your name, amen.